Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, once again to the book of Galatians, and we're in chapter 5. I want to read, uh, just for the connection, from verse 19 uh, to the end of the chapter, uh, Galatians 5, 19 to 26. And we're going to be thinking particularly about the fruit of the Spirit this morning, but before we get to that point, we have to put it on a, like a diamond on a, a black velvet background. And so we want to uh, continue to look at the flesh to begin with, the works of the flesh, and then we'll move in uh, from the polluting factory. Uh, we will move into the orchard and see some of the lovely, luscious fruit of the Spirit. So uh, verse uh, 19, it begins this way. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word. I think last time we had begun by uh, looking at these works of the flesh, and we had talked about the fact that they're divided up into different little groupings, uh, sexual sins, which we considered last time in verse 19. And then we move from there into religious sins, uh, that would be idolatry, witchcraft, and then social sins, beginning at hatred, uh, going all the way down to uh, verse 21, envyings, murders, and then uh, sins of excess, uh, drunkenness and revelings and such like. So that's how uh, it's divided up um, uh, by many. Uh, we want to, uh, just for the sake of uh, kind of keeping things nice and tidy, we'll follow that uh, that uh, methodology. And so we want to begin just to con uh, just moving from sexual sins into religious sins. There are two that are mentioned here, idolatry and witchcraft. Um, when we think of religious sins, um, we tend to, when we think of the flesh, we tend not to think about religious sins. And yet we have to recognize that actually it was religious flesh which crucified Christ. Um, religious flesh launched the Crusades. Uh, religious fre flesh uh, was instrumental in the what we call the the Inquisition, um, the uh, the the growth of Islam throughout the world, uh, s slaughtering those that will not submit. Uh, what is that? It's religious flesh. Even to this very day, it's very evident that we can see religious flesh on display in many, many places. And so religious flesh, beginning with this idea of idolatry. Um, now, we don't usually think of idolatry as one of the works of the flesh, but it really is. Um, it represents religious flesh at its worst. Nothing can be more astonishing than man's determination to worship gods that he has fashioned with his own hands or with his own mind. And I, I make that distinction because it's possible uh, to have an idolatrous view of God without actually having anything made with your own hands. It could be your view of God is, is completely in your heart and in your mind. You've got this view of God that's completely different to how he has revealed himself in Scripture. Uh, in a sense, we, we have crafted a God in our own image and likeness, how we think he should be rather than how he has revealed himself to be. And so, uh, of course, idolatry behind it, we have to recognize uh, that not only is it a work of the flesh, but 
it's also connected with the spirit realm and demonism. And I just want to uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 just to recognize that so often behind the idolatry uh, is the deception of demons. And uh, so we'll notice in uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse um Verse 19, uh, it says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils or demons and not to God, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And so uh, the thought being that um, that often behind uh, these um, these idols uh, that men worship behind it are these deceptive demonic spirits and that's why you can have things like moving statues and all of these things because behind it uh, is this this spirit world that is very very real and so uh, those who worship idols they they really behind it they're worshiping these demonic spirits that make them slaves to every kind of uh, of superstition uh, every kind of suggestion uh, and so it, it's a very deceptive thing but also we need to recognize that um, as well as the the traditional view of you know idolatry where you have this this image that you've made with your own hands, you know, kind of a Bible often ridicules it uh, with half of it. You chop a tree down, half of it you make uh, an idol and nail it down and worship it. The other half you cook your dinner with it. And of course, uh, there's a lot of ridicule of that kind of thing. But w- we want to think about this other aspect of idolatry where uh, we make a God in our own image and likeness in our minds. And so uh, we want to recognize that uh, that when we substitute men's own thoughts and philosophies for God, we're involved in idolatry. Uh, We're we're worshiping, well, man is basically worshiped in our culture today. The philosophies of men, uh, the the intelligence of men, uh, men's own thoughts and ideas are often worshiped men become ultimately worshippers of themselves, setting themselves up to be uh, the ultimate idol or to be as God. I want you to just go back uh, with me for a minute to the book of Ezekiel. It's interesting. My uh, wife and I, uh, I was down in Florida at the week of prayer. She was up here and uh, we were both uh, somehow, we're not reading the re- same reading scheme, but we both were uh meditating on this chapter the same day and we were talking on the phone and we're just amazed at uh, how the Lord had us both in this chapter but uh, why don't you just break in with me in, in Ezekiel 14 verse 3 it says son of man these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face should I be inquired at all by them therefore speak unto them And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him, that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may uh, take the house of Israel in their own heart. And notice this phrase here, because they are all estranged, estranged from me through their idols and i thought wow that's that's really what it's all about isn't it that these idols what they do uh, and of course they, they start in man's heart the heart of man right the heart is deceitful desperately wicked above all things who can know it it all begins in the heart of man creating this god that suits him suits his flesh suits his uh his uh, lifestyle or whatever and as a result of that they become estranged from me, from the true God, through their idols. And so, again, back in Galatians 5, where we're told that uh, one of the great works of the flesh is idolatry. Men become worshippers, ultimately, of themselves. And uh, they worship the created thing rather than the creator. Romans chapter 1 is a wonderful uh, revelation, in a sense, of the result of what idolatry does. And so we could say in our our society, uh, humanism, communism, rationalism, 
are all forms of this kind of idolatry where man's intelligence, man's thoughts have replaced the God of Scripture, the God of Revelation. And so they're basically following uh, their human cleverness rather than the God of Scripture who has revealed himself. All of them are works of the flesh. All of them dethrone God and ultimately enthrone man. Uh, and again, it goes back to the garden, doesn't it? You shall be as gods. <laughs> it really goes back right there that, that man substitutes himself from the God of revelation and he becomes the ultimate. And so he worships himself, his own mind, his own ideas, his own clever, cleverness. And of course, behind it all is the deception of demons. And of course, they become slaves to their own depraved ideas uh, as we saw, you know, or we would see in Romans chapter 1. So idolatry, a work of the flesh. And then witchcraft, again, that, that's a very interesting word. It's that word that we've we've commented on before, pharmakia. And uh, really, it's the idea of this, that a secret tampering with, and at times a worship of the powers of evil, but it's aided through drugs. Drugs is what gets you in connection with the spirit world. That's how it occurs. I um, <clears throat> was uh, staying with a man um, recently, and he was telling me how he got saved. And he said he was on campus at a university. And one of the guys he'd known from childhood was big into drugs. And uh, this guy said he was a guy he kind of avoided because he was just... Um, a, a menace to society because of his drugs. Now, this is in the uh, the late 60s, early 70s. So this particular individual just constantly uh, spaced out on drugs. But all of a sudden, this guy got saved. And it was the talk of the campus. This, this man who was such a terror to everybody was now uh, going around telling people about the Lord Jesus was cleaned up from his drugs. And so... This uh, friend that I was staying with, he asked this man about his story. How did that happen? And he said that the people that were doing drugs with him, he said they began to get in contact through taking drugs with evil spirits. And he said that very experience scared the daylights out of him and caused him to pick up the Bible and read the Bible. And through it, he got saved. And so, again, we just want to make that connection that um, this witchcraft, it's the, the use of drugs, and these drugs uh, somehow provide a portal to the demonic world. And so, uh, that idea of witchcraft, and it's a very, very serious thing. And so, we have to be very, very wary, very careful about these things. And... Um, and, and drugs are very powerful, and they, they can be very mind-altering, but they can also open up that, that portal uh, to the world of evil. And I remember in our New Tribes days studying uh, a tribe called the Yanomami Indians, and uh, they're a fierce tribe in Brazil, and they, um, they snort some kind of thing up their nose. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but again, that's what gets them in touch with the, the spirit world, and they become very, very powerful. And so, again, this is very real. It's very real in much of the world. And I would suggest to you that our world uh, in the West, uh, for years, because uh, drugs were not a part of the West, really Vietnam was when drugs began to be introduced in our society. People came back from Vietnam. They'd been using drugs. They brought them back with them. And it has opened up a whole world of darkness. And so I think we can say without hesitation that uh, so much of the uh, the witchcraft and and it's huge. Witchcraft is huge, by the way. I, when we, I mean, back in the early '80s in England, um, when I was doing ten crusades with another brother up in the Yorkshire Dales, and there were forty-two witches' covens in that area that we were doing these gospel meetings and all kinds of weird things were happening uh, pets were going missing and found impaled on railings uh, all kinds of strange things it was a definite spiritual battle and i want to suggest to you that again uh, one of the things that we've done in the west is we've 
in a sense, we have downplayed the spirit world. And not that we should be looking for demons under every bush. I'm not suggesting that. All I'm suggesting is this, that these deceptive spirits are very real and very powerful. And so, uh, and again, the flesh, there's an appeal to this kind of stuff, to the flesh. There's a curiosity uh, in man, uh, in his flesh, towards this kind of thing. And so we must guard against this. And so it, originally, uh, this word pharmakia meant the use of drugs, which in pagan religions came to be associated with appeals to occult powers, of course, all of them uh, designed to draw attention to the mysterious power of the sorcerer, uh, who key figures in the book of Acts. Uh, you, if you look at Acts 8, Acts 13, Acts 19, you'll see examples of these sorcerers. Uh, their name's Magos, uh, from which we get the word magician. Uh, and so uh, these magicians trafficking uh, in the demonic world, drugs related, all the all this kind of thing. And again, it's all connected with the flesh and it's very real. And again, we you know, the passages we'd much rather speak on, but uh, when we're dealing with the whole of scripture, we have to face reality. This is real. This is a real uh, wicked world that's out there. And again, our flesh, the curiosity of our flesh, uh, we have to watch because uh, there's a sense in which some of these things, um, there's that curiosity gets the better of us. And so the works of the flesh and manifested idolatry, witchcraft, that's religious flesh at its worst. Now we move on to the social sins and we think of hatred and we see it so evident in our society. The world is full of both religious, racial, and political strife, fostered by demonic spirit of hatred and enmity working behind the scenes. Um, people just can't live at peace with others. Uh, there's this mutual animosity, this hate, hatefulness. And uh, just want you to look at, again, this is, some of us were like this before our conversion. This was a good description of what we were like. If you look at Titus, glorious section in Titus chapter three, where it describes what we were before coming to faith in the finished work of Christ. And it says in verse three, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Wow, what a description. And then it says, but, and that lovely contrast word, after the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing, washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. But we could say this without question, the flesh often leads to this kind of hatred. Um, not being able to live at peace with others, the so-called, and we see it in different ways in society, the so-called class struggle uh, internationally amongst nations, uh, the hatred of one nation towards another, um, the anti-Semiticism uh, that is very evident in our day, a, a completely irrational hatred. Uh, we see it on the campuses. We see it every single day now. Uh, and again, this is all, it's the flesh. That's what it is in all its ugliness. And again, uh, we, we, we see it manifested in society. We see the devastation of it in society. So hatred, uh, variance, uh, this is a spirit of rivalry, uh, contention and wrangling. And, and so uh, people at variance with each other, they're, they're, um, they're, they're rivals uh, in this um, uh, rivalry. You see it, you see it in sports, um, uh, rivalry taken to such levels that there's incredible hostility and hatred uh, to opposing teams and their supporters, that kind of thing, variance, emulations. Uh, this is the next word of the flesh, and it's the idea, of, it comes from the word zealous, uh, which we get English word zeal from. It stands for also in a negative sense, jealousy, uh, when, when it's used in a bad sense. And so um, uh, we, we see that in Scripture, for instance, in uh, Philippians, Paul talks about people uh, preaching out of envy and strife. 
uh, and again, uh, this this thought of um, this uh, hostility uh, towards others, uh, we want to copy them in a sense, uh, try to be like them. And so there were people who didn't like the Apostle Paul, but they tried to emulate him. And so they were preaching like, and he, he just said, well, as long as Christ is preached. Uh, but um, if somebody draws uh, us into admiration and a desire and determination to emulate our rival, uh, it can lead to bitter animosity and resentment. Uh, but it's the idea we want to be like them. We want to compete with them. And so we, we can see uh, this, again, another evidence of the flesh, uh, emulations, and then wrath. Wrath is uh, outbursts of anger, fits of rage, uncontrolled temper. It, 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 the word signifies a blaze of temper which does not last, but it flares up and then subsides. And so it's just like this big outburst of anger. And um, interesting comment here. It says, bad-tempered people might get over their ill humor, but they leave scars in other people's memories that are not so quickly erased. And it's true, isn't it? Uh, somebody in a fit of rage can say something very, very bad, and um, then they get over it, and everything's fine again. Uh, this this outburst is, has run its course, but the consequences for those that have been the, as it were, the rece on the receiving end of this outburst uh, can be felt for a long time afterwards. And then, uh, again, he says... Um, Strife, uh, wrath, strife, uh, again, this party spirit, uh, so often uh, promotion uh, of this party spirit. Uh, this, is, this is how churches can get divided very easily because there, there are party spirits that develop, uh, ends up in splitting into different groupings with different emphases. And so that, that idea of strife and behind it is selfish ambition, self-seeking or rivalry. It's rooted in pride. Uh, we've said it many times, Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride comes contention. And so this kind of strife, uh, it's really rooted in, uh, I want to have the influence. I want to be the powerful person. And so develop a party of people around you, a party spirit promoting uh, their agenda and often resulting in splitting uh, amongst the people of God. And again, when when you have these divisions in churches, it's always interesting how um, we always try to put a spiritual spin on it and give a very spiritual, rational reason behind it. But I, I love the way uh, God just kind of pulls all that away and simply says this, it's a work of the flesh. That's what's really behind it. It's just the flesh. It's the evidence of the flesh being manifested in people's lives. Selfish ambition, self-seeking, uh, Philippian assembly, beautiful assembly, but it's really in danger of succumbing to strife between two sisters who labor together in the gospel. They can't get on, and pretty soon there'll be one group standing with one sister, another group favorable to the other sister. And if it's not dealt with, and, of course, he deals with it by bringing in humility. That's the answer to pride. Uh, don't do anything from strife or vain glory. And the whole assembly is in danger uh, of being divided. And so, we, again, we just need to be aware that this is the flesh. And then seditions. Uh, the next word, seditions, comes from uh, the idea of standing apart. Uh, gives comes from the, the word, our English word, dichotomy. Uh, Paul warns to the believers in Rome uh, to mark those who cause divisions. Uh, that's the word that's used here. Again, seditions, this word division, standing apart, causes division, cause one group to stand apart from the other. Uh, watch out for those kind of people. Avoid them. Those who split churches often think themselves to be spiritual. And of course, the Galatian assembly is in assemblies are in danger of this right now, aren't they? There's this group coming in and they're they're in danger of causing a division. Uh, we talked about chapter five, verse 15 there. They're going to bite and devour one another. How is that all happening? Well, there's division coming in. Those that are pro Mosaic law and those that are opposed to uh, this imposition of Mosaic law. And so this is kind of the idea. It all comes back to the flesh. 
uh, hardly an issue in life exists over which men will not squabble and divide. And so we've got this idea of uh, of the continued uh, evidence of the flesh in these seditions. And then heresies, uh, difference between this and the previous one is that uh, the former is the beginning of a sect, this division. Uh, the latter is the division developed and matured. And so it, it literally becomes uh, what we call a heresy. It's a full-blown division. And often uh, how heresy got connected with false teaching is usually it's seen in an overemphasis or a perversion of truth. And so this division behind it all, there's somebody who's either overemphasizing some truth uh, at the expense of other truths or perverting truth. And so the division kind of develops around this uh, this perversion of scripture, but it ends up being a full-blown division. Uh, and so, and then envyings. Next, Paul lists envyings. The word is uh, in, used in the New Testament always in a negative sense. Uh, Solomon said that envy is the rottenness of the bones. Uh, it's an amazing thing. And you think about what envy has done uh, as we consider the word of God. Uh, it, it's a feeling of displeasure that grudges what another one possesses. So it could be it could be envious of their looks, envious of their intelligence, and envious uh, envious of their industry, uh, whatever it could be. Uh, but this this envy, it's cruel and bitter. And of course, we we see such examples of env envy in Scripture. Uh, it was envy that caused Cain to murder Abel. It was envy that sold Joseph into slavery. It was envy that persecuted David and hunted him like a wild animal. And it was envy, even Pilate recognized it, that was responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. He recognized that they were moved with envy. <laughs> That's what motivated the, uh, the religious leaders because the common people heard him, the Lord Jesus, gladly. And they were losing their power base, and they were envious of him. And so uh, as a result of that, they uh, ended up crucifying Christ. And so envy is a terrible thing, and uh, we, it, it's very easy to get caught up in it. It's a very uh, fleshly thing, and uh, we just need to be careful that we don't envy what somebody else has. We need to rejoice in another person's usefulness, giftedness, whatever it is, and not envy it. And then, of course, murders you don't need much description of that. But again, it's an evidence of the flesh, uh, maybe a combination of all these things, jealousy, envy, all the rest of it, all coming to fruition in murder. So that's the social sins. And again, what a description of our world. This is we, we've just been talking about what our world is like. And unfortunately, sometimes these things, because the fl flesh is still in every one of us, sometimes these things can be manifest in the church as well. They ought not to be, but they can be if we give ourselves over to the flesh. And so then uh, he goes on and he talks about the what we call social sins. And he terms drunkenness here now again it drunkenness it weakens a person's control over his words and actions it kind of lowers a person's inhibitions um and um we've kind of downplayed the idea of drunkenness as a work of the flesh we often refer to a person as an alcoholic and and again this is psychology 101 coming in here it's real. We're now saying it's a disease rather than a manifestation of the flesh. And therefore, because it's a disease, what it needs is treatment rather than a work of the flesh that needs repentance. And that's again, that's why psychology, in a sense, is it goes back to this idolatry. It's, it's idolizing man's cleverness, making uh, not only making a, a god uh, out of man and man's intelligence, uh, but it's it's undermining the reality of the word of God. And so um, 
it, it destroys what what it does when we say oh it, it's 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 out al- they're an alcoholic um we're taking away personal responsibility they can't help it they've got a disease you know they're <laughs> like i mean you just catch a disease uh, no this is a work of the flesh that needs to be repented of and again we just need to recognize that social sins they're very real uh, and of course lead to other things the next thing is revelings and of, of course uh, they go very often together drunkenness and revelings um uh, it, it goes back to the uh, the licentious groups of devotees uh, to the greek god bacchus uh, the god of wine and uh, it suggests revelry that goes beyond the barriers of restraint revelry that has degenerated into full license uh, a picture of all kinds of immorality uh, often uh, as we said a near neighbor of drunkenness things like orgies um, uh, wild parties all the outcome of drunkenness uh, and debauchery and so again it's it's kind of these things going to their fullest and notice he says having gone through this list and i know it's not pleasant i, I know uh, there's lots of other things we'd rather hear about but this is real this is this is what the flesh produces but what he wants us to see in this next phrase is that this list is not exhaustive it says and such like and what he's saying is that as horrible as this list is it's not the full extent of what the flesh can produce we're just getting a glimpse of this is what flesh produces but if we could go on i mean every evil imagination uh, known to man can be the result of the flesh it just goes on and on and such like and so he wants us to know that and then he goes on and we we talked a little bit about this in our q and a last time uh, he says of the which i tell you before as i have told you in time past that they which do that word do there is practice and so it's not not a slip up here it's not somebody uh you know kind of slipping into this this is a way of life this is what characterizes the person if somebody is characterized by these things this is this is how they live this is this is their lifestyle he says those that practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of god in other words this would be like somebody who is completely unregenerate they are just completely given over to these things it marks their life and it says that person are excluded uh, from the kingdom of god uh, with these habitual practices of course we have a similar list to this in 1st corinthians 6 and again when we look at 1st corinthians chapter 6 uh it's interesting that um he talks about um, uh, verse 9 know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators idolaters idulterers effeminate abusers themselves with mankind thieves covetous drunkards revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of god very simple language but then he makes this amazing comment in verse 11 and such were some of you but you were washed but you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the lord jesus by the spirit of our god and what he's telling us is this that the the assembly in corinth was made up of people who were once practicing all of these sins that are mentioned here that was uh, so you can you imagine what the testimony meeting would have been like in the assembly at corinth as they were describing their past life and then coming to christ and what christ did for them how he he cleaned them up they were they were so filthy he washed them he sanctified them he set apart them for his own purpose he justified them he declared them righteous in the name of the lord jesus by the spirit of our god and so again this is what they used to be but that's not what they are anymore they've become new creatures in christ part of a new creation and again the power of the gospel to change men and yet as we know full well the flesh doesn't get eradicated at conversion and so this is why we must depend moment by moment on the indwelling spirit and so now he moves on 
having stated these things to verse 22. And again, we get that lovely contrast word. Having looked at the works of the flesh, this is the activity of the flesh, the 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 pollution factory that we've described, just polluting the world with its filth and all this, uh, all product of the flesh. He says, but in contrast to that, and and that's why this is it, it, that's why it was necessary, I think, for us to go through uh, that that dark section is to set on this this beautiful dark velvet background of the flesh, a lovely diamond, uh, something that stands out and shines brightly. And what is that? It's the fruit. Now notice singular, uh, although there's nine things listed here, um, uh, the word fruit is singular. And so uh, what does the spirit produce in a person's life. Well, it, it lists these nine characteristics. And what we could say is this, the fruit, what, what is the spirit going to produce in our lives? These nine characteristics, I think, are a beautiful description of the Lord Jesus. What the spirit produces in the saint of God is Christ-likeness. And so we have different aspects of the beauties of the Savior seen in this uh, description of the fruit of the Spirit. A little word, but but it great events, great things hinge on this little contrast word. Uh, we already saw it in Titus, that we were hateful, hating one another. But then it goes on, it says, but after the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward men appeared. And so, so many scriptures, we have that that amazing contrast from the darkness, the blackness, the bleakness of man uh, in sin, and then the glorious results of what man is in Christ. And so now we, we move from this factory to the Holy Spirit orchard, producing delicious, fragrant fruit of Christ-likeness. That which is produced in the life of the believer by the energy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Fruit in contrast to works. Works indicate the energy and activity of man. Fruit suggests the product of an inward power. Particularly here, the inward power of the Holy Spirit manifesting Christ's likeness through the child of God. Now, just as the flesh was divided up uh, for, for just for our uh, benefit, perhaps, of understanding things, some have tried, uh, I don't know how successfully, to divide up the fruit of the Spirit as well. And what they have come up with, I'm just going to give you their suggestion, is this. The first three uh, uh, characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, are... Um, compromise Christian habits of mind in their more general aspect. And the primary direction is God word, God word. And so it all, because Christ has done so much for us, this love that now is evidenced through the spirit in our lives, directed towards God, first of all, because of all that he's done for us. Uh, and the joy again comes because of our relationship with God, peace, all because of our new relationship that we enjoy with God. The second set primarily deal with a Christian uh, in his relationship to others and our social virtues. So how do we deal with others? Well, long-suffering, uh, gentleness, goodness. And the last three concern the Christian as he is into himself. And so faithfulness, meekness, temperance, things that are to be seen in his life uh, as a result of this indwelling heavenly guest and depending on him. And so as he is to be in himself, uh, these three beautiful things, faithfulness, meekness, temperance should be seen. So as we work our way through this little list, um, of course, love that is mentioned here is this agape love. Uh, it's uh, spontaneous uh, it's a uh, uh, love that is sacrificial. Uh, the same love is to flow through the believer uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can't manufacture it. 
and neither can the flesh imitate it. It is the product of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of the saint. And again, maybe he is mentioning this uh, particularly in contrast uh, to chapter 5, verse 15, uh, where he says, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And so uh, the Galatians were in danger of destroying each other. And again, what, what's the reason? Well, it's really connected with the flesh. And yet he said, what's the, the need of the hour is for the Spirit of God to produce that, that agape love in us and uh, particularly towards other believers, but also beyond that, uh, love for other Christians, meaning no matter what they say about us or how they act towards us, this is supernatural. We just love them. We keep on loving them because they are his. And so that love is so essential, isn't it? And again, we uh, I mentioned before, but Mr. Wesley really believed that that was key uh, to victorious Christian living. If somehow the love of God could fill our hearts, it would affect everything, how we, how we deal with our fellow men, how we deal uh, with our fellow saints. Uh, it would have a huge impact. And so this love is so vital. And then joy. Some have suggested joy is human uh, happiness depends on happenings, what happens. But joy is the happiness of heaven imported by the Spirit of God into the human heart. <laughs> and it's interesting that it's not based on circumstances. Um, Paul, in his joy epistle, Philippians, that mentions joy frequently, it's a prison epistle. Uh, the man's restricted in his movements, uh, and yet it is absolutely um, full of joy. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so we just need to recognize that, that, uh, that joy is not dependent on circumstances. We see the Philippian uh, jail situation when, when they're, they had their backs beaten with rods and, um, and bleeding, and they're in the inner prison, no air circulating, and they're in stocks, and, and they have a praise meeting in their hearts. So there's obviously a joy there that is, that is just incredible. And you, you read uh, stories of, of the martyrdom of the saints, and despite what they're going through, there's a joy unspeakable and full of glory seen in their lives, could not be produced by human means. This is the Spirit of God, as it were, importing, uh, as we said, the happiness of heaven uh, into a receptive human heart. And then peace. What is that peace? It's that peace that Christ gives. My peace I live, leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Uh, again, John 14, 27, uh, the world knows nothing of this kind of peace, peace that passes all understanding, uh, that that peace because because we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And and as a result of that, there's, there's that peace in the heart of the believer, tranquility or contentment enjoyed by those who live in harmony with the will of God. And the world knows nothing of this kind of peace. So now we, we move on uh, to the ones that relate to our relationship with our fellow believers, long-suffering. The word is a great, I love the word of, uh, be, the Greek word here, macrothumia, macrothumia. Macros, long, and thumos is temper, long-tempered. The very opposite of the outburst of wrath that we saw in the previous listing of the works of the flesh. Uh, you remember this, it just bursts out, whereas this, long-suffering, long-tempered person, uh, forbearance, patience, just lots of, uh, lots of patience. And again, it's, this is a God thing. This is, this is God uh, showing his long-suffering during the days prior to the flood, 120 years. This is God's long-suffering with the, uh, the iniquity of the Ammonites. Uh, Amorites is not yet full. Uh, this is this is God's long suffering with the human race, and so long suffering in the face of provocation and insult. Uh, it's supernatural. Again, it's not something that can be produced naturally. Our natural response under provocation is to lash out, <laughs> is to uh, somehow deal with the issue uh, rather than just uh, allowing uh, time and just calmly not responding 
in a fleshly way. And so the energy of the flesh might make a fair show of forgiving seven times, but only the Holy Spirit could enable a person to forgive 70 times seven. <laughs> only the Spirit of God can produce that kind of life. And we said this, that, you know, the Christian life is not just difficult. It's impossible apart from the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. These things are impossible outside of the work of the Spirit of God living within us. And then a gentleness. We should be marked by a gentle kindness as we go through lives with compassion for others. And uh, the godless world we live in, these qualities are so lacking. Uh, but it's good to be, you know, kind of the macho man who's uh, kind of uh, always out to get even and get revenge. That's kind of the cultural hero. But a person who is gentle in his dealings with others is looked down on in our society. And so gentleness, goodness, uh, goodness which is beneficial always to others. Just like the Lord Jesus, he went about doing good. A man who is under the control of the Holy Spirit, goodness will mark his ways, will mark his character. Uh, because that goodness, it doesn't mean that um, there's not firmness, there's not um, a rebuke or correction when necessary, uh, but behind it all is this desire to do men good. And to do men good, sometimes to do men good, you have to confront wrong, <laughs> uh, and but out of a, a desire to help the person. So goodness should be seen. And then faith, um, in Galatians, the word faith, most likely, uh, because it's dealing with um, character qualities, would be that idea of faithfulness and trustworthiness. Um, because all the other fruits of the spirit that are fruit of the spirit that are mentioned are all moral qualities. So it would make us reliable. And again, faithfulness is a rare commodity, isn't it? Uh, scripture talks about the faithful man who can find. <laughs> In other words, it's, this is a rare breed, uh, faithfulness. And of course, God is faithful. This is something that is a characteristic of God. Uh, Christ is the faithful and true witness of Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And so uh, it's part of it, 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 the Spirit is producing Christ likeness in the saint. And part of that is faithfulness. Uh, somebody who's dependable, somebody who's reliable, somebody who you can have confidence in that they'll do what they say they're going to do. That this idea of, of faithfulness. And then meekness uh, in english uh, we often equate, equate meekness with weakness this is a big mistake because it's not it's not weakness it's strength under control i think i've mentioned this before but i met a guy he breaks horses and horses are powerful they they are creatures that i find very frightening uh, they're just so big they're so powerful uh, they have tremendous power, and we even use the term, don't we, horsepower, <laughs> uh, because they're, they're a definition of what is powerful. But when a horse is broken, they use the term, it is meat. In other words, that power is now brought under control and is very, very useful. And I think it's a lovely description, because the Lord Jesus does he have power? Absolutely. Spoke the worlds into existence. He holds it together with the word of his mouth. He has absolute power. And yet that strength is under control. Uh, I am meek and lowly in heart, he says. Uh, he had tremendous power, but that power was under control at all times. It's the, it would be, meekness would be the opposite of self-assertiveness arrogance and violence. It's one who is gentle and mild, who is not using their position of strength uh, to be hurtful to others. A meek man is one who accepts the will of God without resentment. He can afford to be gentle and mild because of the inward strength that is produced by the Spirit. It's always associated with lowliness and wisdom. James talks about the wisdom of meekness. And so, again, how that is needed. And then the final one, perhaps one that's more difficult for all of us, that is temperance. Uh, 
the idea of self-control, the mastery over every desire, impulse, appetite, and longing. It enables a person to walk through this world completely in control of himself so that he triumphs when others around him are falling. This quality produced by the spirit spells victory. And then he says an interesting thing as he concludes this list, just as he said an interesting thing when he concluded the list of the flesh where he said, and such like, in other words, it's not exhaustive, it's, there's more to that list. Here he says, uh, against such, there is no law. And so the, it's, a, it's a wonderful truth. Uh, they're produced by the Spirit of God, uh, and um, law is given to restrain and condemn, but it finds nothing in these excellent qualities to demand such action. These virtues fulfill the law and give pleasure to the lawgiver. They found perfect expression in the life of the Lord Jesus. And what a transformation we would see if there was more of an emphasis on the fruit of the Spirit than there has been on the gifts of the Spirit. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? There was a, a big craze, um, especially brought about by the charismatic movement, and it was all about the gifts, especially the sign gifts, but gifts, 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 gifts. And yet these lovely graces of the fruit of the Spirit, oh, how different our world would be, our churches would be, if there was more of an emphasis on the fruit, this lovely fruit of the Spirit. And so he says there's no law against this. And again, I think it's good if we concentrate on just depending on the indwelling heavenly guest. We don't have to be worried uh, about uh, offending anybody or kind of meeting up to a standard. We just allow the Spirit to produce Christ-likeness through us. And so he says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. What a vivid Im uh, image of crucifixion. Uh, he's used it in other places. Uh, Romans 6.6, 6, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Our old man is crucified. But there's a, a slight difference here. In those uh, previous instances, Romans 6, 6, Galatians 2, 20, the, the verb is in the passive voice. It means was crucified or have been crucified. Our old man has been crucified. References to what has been done for the believer as a result of Christ's death. And Christ died, we died with him, our old man. All that we were uh, in Adam was crucified with him. But in this passage, the verb is in the active voice, and points to what the believer has himself done and must continue to regard to be done. <laughs> He's not to seek to remove from the cross what has once been nailed there. He continues to recognize that, reckon on that to be true. And so he's crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Again, Spirit leads as they follow. The idea is getting in line with or keep in step with the Spirit, uh, just like we're told to keep in step of the faith of our father Abraham uh, or obey the truth of the gospel. We're to keep in step with the Spirit. And he says, finally, verse 26, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Perhaps he, he closes with this because that's exactly what's going on in the assembly in assemblies in Galatia. Uh, there's a lot of vain glory, a lot of pride, pride in the law, pride in circumcision, pride in these things. And it, it is resulting in provoking one another, envying one another. It's causing much, much devastation to the saints. And so he's telling us, let's not do that. There's a better plan. There's a better way. There's a better way to live. There's a better way for us to get along together. And it's if we would all simply recognize that the Spirit of God alone can produce Christ-likeness in our lives if we would all but simply depend in Him. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.